then you panic. And, and you turn and you swim in another direction. But now you've totally lost your sense of direction. And you've totally lost all orientation. And you don't know where the shore is. And your heart beats faster and faster as you try to decide uh, the way to go. And, and you, you decide you better conserve your energy and maybe float for a little while. And then you notice that little light that you see through the fog begins to dim. And you realize that it, the sun is going down. And it gets dark. And you listen with everything you have. If only you could hear a voice from the shore. I mean, even a, a faint voice would, would help you in some way. It would give you some sense of direction, something to swim towards. And Job must have felt something like that when he sat in the rubble of what was once a beautiful and prosperous landscape. His livelihood was gone, ruined. And the fresh graves of his children lay there before him. He lost everything, even his health. He sat in the ashes of his life, crushed, alone, without direction. And he couldn't even hear God's voice. And not knowing why all of this happened to him, he began to voice his distress. Now look over at Job. I mean, we're in Esther. Job is right there in the next book. Look at chapter 3. Job chapter 3. Look at verses 1 through 3. After this opened Job his mouth and cursed his day. And Job spake and said, Let the day perish wherein I was born, and the night in which it was said, There is a man-child conceived. And then look down in verse 11. Why did I not from, my, from the womb, or why died I not from the womb? Why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Those are words from the lake, words in the fog. Those are words of a man who doesn't know why. And he feels abandoned. And really, he's worse than dead because he's very much alive in his misery. Now look over at verses 24 through 26 of chapter 3 of Job. For my sighing cometh before I eat, and my roarings are poured out like the waters. For the thing which I greatly feared has come upon me, and that which I was afraid of has come unto me. I was not in safety, neither had I rest, neither was I quiet. Yet trouble came. Yet trouble came. Job is living the worst kind of existence. He has lost everything that was precious to him. His body is covered with sores. But the worst is to hear no voice from God. Why does God sometimes seem absent in our time of need? We have to understand God's timing in our day. From the moment, or from the account of Job's misery, let's look at a realm that is not nearly so measurable or tangible, the realm of time. Our time versus God's time. See, you and I are locked in this tiny space on this foggy lake of life called the present. Because our whole perspective is based on this moment that we're living right now. We speak of the present, the past, and the future. And if we want to know the hour or minute or second, all we need to look at is our watch. If we want to know the day or the month or the year or the century, we look at a calendar. Time, easily marked, carefully measured, understandable, and conscious. But God's not like that, not at all. All right, He moves. He moves outside of the realm of our earthly time, beyond the, the ticking of our clock, beyond the the turning of our calendar. God has no night. God has no day. God has no month. God has no year. God has no past, present, or future. And theologians call this the transcendence of God. 
He transcends all. He's outside of time. He's outside of everything. We see our life in a sequence of frames moving one th- to another, like kind of like a movie. But not God. He sees all the movie of life all at once in a flash. And get this. At the same time as he sees our life flash through like a movie, he sees the billions and millions of others' lives, past, present, and future, at one time. At one time. Not like a movie, but at one time. He sees everything all at once. He's transcended. He's outside of time. It's hard for our finite minds to wrap around that fact, but it is true. He transcends time. Diane Ball wrote a hymn called In His Time. And the words are so easily sung, In His Time, In His Time, He makes all things beauty, beautiful in its, His time. Lord, please show me every day, as you're teaching me your way, that you do just what you say in your time. But immediately we have a problem. Philip Yancey in his volume, Disappointment with God, writes this. He says, No matter how we rationalize, God will sometimes seem unfair from the perspective of a person trapped in time. Only at the end of time, after we have attained God's level of viewing, after every evil has been punished or forgiven, every illness illness healed, and the entire universe restored, only then will fairness reign. Then we will understand what role is played by evil, and the fall, and by natural law, and in in an unfair event like the death of a child. Until then, we will not know. We can only trust in a God who does know. We remain ignorant of many details, not because God enjoys keeping us on the, in the dark, but because we have not the fic, uh, facti- faculties to absorb so much light. At a single glance, God knows what the world is about and how history will end. But we time-bound creatures have only the most primitive manner of understanding. We can let time pass. Not until history has run its course will we understand how All things work together for good. Faith means believing in advance what will only make sense in reverse. That's hard to do, isn't it? It's as hard as moving from the chorus of in his time, in his time. He makes all things beautiful in his time on Sunday to the foggy yet real world of pain and loss and sudden earthquakes and tornadoes and unexpected floods and premature premature deaths on Tuesday morning or on Wednesday night or on Friday at midnight. So what do we do? How do we live in the fog without panic? How do we live our lives in this little space, not knowing where the shore is, especially during the times when we do not hear His reassuring voice? To put it simple and straight, we do it by discovering how God works by having confidence in Him. We need to discover God's working in, 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 by looking at Esther's day. Now in the Bible, just before Job, we find the book of Esther. And as I've said before, it's the only book in the Bible where God isn't named, and neither is prayer per se. Nothing is quoted from Esther in the New Testament. And we'd be tempted to think that He's really absent. But that's surely not the case. I mean, his prints are all over this story. And we can see the movements of God's hand throughout the lives of Esther and Mordecai. We can see his moving in the heart of the Ahasuerus. We can see him as he works his own will, even through the wicked plots of Haman. How? Why? Because the book is written from the perspective of God's transcendent presence. Therefore, when we come to chapter 3 and we come across that sustained period of time of silence between chapter 2 and 3, the beginning of chapter 3, 
uh, during which the king promotes Haman, we want to say this. No, don't do it. Don't. You'll be sorry, king. He's a bad guy. He hates the Jews. And he's going to work out a murderous plan. So don't promote him. But Ahasuerus promotes him. An evil game plan gets underway. And we want God to stop it. But there's no voice from the shore. The fog thickens as we watch Haman lay the groundwork for exterminating all the Jews in the entire kingdom of Persia. We watch as the official seal of the king is presented or pressed softly into the clay and the edict of death goes forth across the land and throughout all the provinces. And we think, now, God, stop. Stop this wrong. But again, there's no voice from the shore. And it must have been like that for the Jews living in Europe during the Nazi reign when the Nazis came to power. Hitler's henchmen came and they brutalized and they mocked and they killed. And there was no voice from the shore. Now, if we had been in that lake of silence, we surely would have wondered, where is God? No doubt. We would have asked those questions. Eli Weissel the great prize-winning writer of the Holocaust tells in his book Night how he stood as a child, how he stood as a child, hearing the terrorizing sounds of death, viewing the horrible sights of death, smelling burning flesh from the oven. And shocked by it all, he heard a man behind him groan, Where is God? Where is he? Yet, even at such times, God is at work. And listen, if you don't know this, and if you don't believe this, and if you don't remember this when, the, when he says silent, then guess what? You're going to panic, and you will doubt, and you will become cynical, resentful, and full of bitterness. Think of it this way. We've heard great sermons on Joseph. We've also listened to great sermons on Moses. But have you ever heard a sermon on the 400 plus years, those silent years that separate Joseph from Moses? And we move along in history and we come to Hannah. And this woman of God prayed for a son. And Samuel came. And we hear great messages on Hannah or great messages on Samuel. But I don't think I've heard a message preached on 1 Samuel 3.1, which says this, And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Now in the Strong's Concordance, we see that the word precious comes from a word that means rare. All right, so it was precious because it was rare. So what this verse is saying is, and the word from the Lord was rare in those days, and visions were infrequent. And we think the prophets were the ones who regularly heard God's voice. But not always. Consider the prophet, prophet Habakkuk, who watched unjust events occur back to back, one after another, and they didn't stop. And finally, he couldn't take God's silence any longer. And he says to the Lord in chapter 1, and verses 1 through 4 of Habakkuk, Then the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, O Lord, how long shall I cry, and thou not, will not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save? Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are they and there are that raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass the righteous. Therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Habakkuk was saying, why? And while we're at it, how long? What was the problem? Well, Habakkuk was treading, treading water on the lake. The fog had rolled in. 
Others can sing in his time, in his time, all they want. But right now, I'm drowning, Habakkuk says. And between Malachi and the birth of the Lord, there's another 400 period years of period years of silence that you probably never heard a sermon about. Absolute stark silence. Not even one writing of a verse of Scripture for four centuries. And that's tough to take. But if you want to discover how God works, not only in Esther's day, but in our day, then keep these two things in mind. First, life is filled with sustained periods of silence. Often. But those periods of God's silence are just as significant as times when he speaks. Well, they're more painful, but nevertheless significant. And during times on that fog-bound lake, you need ears of faith to listen for his voice. Right? Even in times of silence. And his surprising sovereignty often takes time to unfold. And second, the turning points of life, the significant events, are often subtle. The turning points of life, the significant events, are often subtle. For example, in Esther chapter 6, we read that the king couldn't sleep. Now, when was the last time that made news? I mean, I don't believe I ever read this line in the news stories that, that I've ever read. Well, the president couldn't sleep last night. I mean, it's even, it's even subtle in the biblical record. But as a result, Mordecai's name breaks forth out of the obscurity, which leads to the missing pieces of the puzzle that are critical for God's plan. In the mystery of God's timing, subtle things occur that the sensitive heart picks up. And listen, that's the role that wisdom plays in life. Reading the life subtleties is what Christian maturity is all about. And rather than thrashing around thinking, I'll never make it out of this, I'll never make it through this, I'll never hear God's voice, we need to determine in wisdom to watch for the slightest turning of those events. And right after the sleepless night, who's in the court of the king? Of all people, Haman. Haman, who still has splinters in his hands from building the gallows on which to hang Mordecai. He showed up early, thinking that he's going to get his way. Uh Uh-uh, wrong. The king calls him in and says, how should we honor someone? And Haman thinks, ha, who better to honor than me? Wrong again. That's not God's plan. He's planning to honor Mordecai. And Haman ends up eating a huge slice of humble pie, being the one who leads Mordecai through Shushan, proclaiming his greatness. And I'd call that a rather significant change of events. You know, it's easy to live in monotony, and many people do. It's easy to anticipate that this year will be very much like last year and the one before that, when in fact, chances are good that it will be completely different. So when the events begin to turn, realize that none of it is merely merely coincidental. And we need to remember that. Take the word coincidental out of your vocabulary, along with luck. You can trash them both. You don't need them anymore. Listen, nothing is coincidental. Luck has no place and Christian's vocabulary. In his time, and only in his time, he begins to move in subtle ways until his sovereignty unfolds to change, to, for changes to take place. But don't fight it, okay? It's God's way of lifting the fog, which always happens when he pleases. For example, Look at this moment in Esther's life. The dinner that saved the Jews. Look at chapter 7 and verse 1 and 2. So the king and Haman came to banquet with Esther, the queen, 
And the king said again unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be given, granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed even unto the half of the kingdom. Now the second banquet is the event, the moment that breaks the silence. And once again, it's just the three of them, the king, the queen, and the prime minister. And when Esther arrived in the banquet room, the king addresses her at calling her Queen Esther. And that, this gives emphasis to the fact that she, has a royal, she is a royal person, not just a subject. And again, he asked what she wanted, even if it meant up to half of the kingdom, it would be given to her. And, you know, maybe the Lord put those words in his mouth to assure Esther that she didn't need to be afraid to present her petition before the king. What is your petition, the king asked Esther. What is your request? Now, he's already asked that two other times. When he, she first approached him and he held out a scepter, and then at the first banquet. But Esther never answered him because the timing wasn't right. See, Esther had a sensitive ear, a wise heart. And she sensed that the timing wasn't right. So she didn't push it. She knew when to act. She knew when to wait. Let me ask you, are you sensitive like that? Do you know when to listen? Do you know when to speak up and when to keep quiet? Do you know how much to say as well as when to say it? Do you have the wisdom to hold back until the right moment? Listen, those things make a difference. And obviously, nobody bats a thousand on matters such as this, but the question is still, are you sufficiently in tune with God to read His subtle signals? See, it's easy to jump at the first sighting of the fog's lifting. But Esther, though, trapped in that fog-bound silence, that little space of limited sight, had not told all that she had on her heart. The time wasn't right. Until this moment, she hadn't even told the king that she was a Jew. But now, the right moment had arrived to break the silence. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1 says, To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. Well, that's verse 7. Verse 1 says, To everything there is a season... And then verse 7, and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. I got that wrong. Well, that's what it says. Time to keep silence and a time to speak. So silence was once appropriate, but not anymore. And, and you know, you have to wonder if Esther's heart wasn't beating in her throat as she realized that her nation's future hung on the, in the balance of the few words that she would speak and the response of her husband, the king. And once the king opened the door the third time, Esther then took courage to express her petition, which leads to the disclosure that shocked the king. Look at verses 3 and 4. Then Esther, the queen, answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had, not, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Now, the first shock the king received was something that he had not known up until this time, that his queen, queen was a Jewess. And when she told him that it was her people that were in danger, she identified herself for the first time with her people, the Jews. Now, Mordecai, I remember, had told her not to identify herself as a Jew earlier in the story, but now she came out and made herself known to the king. Now, the king now knows that because she was Jewish, Jewish, the plot that Haman had talked about, uh, had talked him into, 
that jeopardized the life of the woman he loved, his queen. The Jews were sentenced to die. And the king now knew that his wife was among those that were sentenced. Which leads to the discovery that sentenced the enemy. Look at verse 5. Then the king Ahasuerus answered and said unto Esther, the queen, Who is he? And where is he that doth presume in his heart to do so? Now at this point, my response might have been, if I were asked this question in this place, what do you mean? Who is he? I mean, you were there when Haman purposed this hideous, uh, proposed this hideous thing. You gave him your seal and signed the edict. What do you mean, who is he? I mean, open your eyes. Probably a good thing I wasn't there. I'd have blown it. And you know what? We live in a world of preoccupied people. I mean, they too live in a fog. I mean, who knows how many edicts that Ahasuerus had signed that day? Who knows how many pressing matters of government were on his mind? The king had countless decisions to make. And Haman, who was his trusted official, had proposed it in such a way that it seemed to be solving a problem that directly affected the good of the kingdom. So the king probably signed without giving it a great deal of attention, believing that Haman, the man who he trusted, knew what he was doing. Suddenly, however, things had changed. Listen, don't ever try to convince me that some situation in this life is absolutely permanent. Listen, God can move in the heart of a king. He can move in an entire nation. He can bring down the once impenetrable iron curtain. He can change the mind of your stubborn mate. He can move in affairs of your community. He can alter decisions of presidents and prime ministers and present-day kings and national dictators. No barrier is too high. No chasm is too wide for him. Because he's not limited by time or space or the visible or the invisible. Remember, he lives in a realm that transcends all that. He's all-powerful. And when God is ready to move, he moves. And when he does, hang on. I mean, you're in for the ride of your life. And realizing that her moment had arrived, Esther neither stammered nor hesitated. Verse 6. And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and queen. So Esther, clothed in strength and dignity, answers with the same kind of courage she had shown since her decision to risk it all. Who is responsible? That man, our enemy, that wicked Haman. Now before she mentioned his name, she used three strong words to describe him. He was the adversary, a term that is also used in the Bible to describe Satan. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. He's also called an enemy. Another reference to Satan in Matthew 13, verse 39. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. And thirdly, he's called wicked. 1 John 2.14 I have written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men because ye are strong. And the word of God abideth in you and ye have overcome the wicked one. So all these phrases are used to describe Satan. And and Esther still uses them to describe Haman. And remember what we learned in the beginning of our study about Satan's attempt to prevent Jesus from being born? Haman, no doubt, is a tool in Satan's hand. The enemy of Esther's people had been found out. And he who could decree that a whole nation be destroyed without a twinge of remorse was now afraid. Now, Haman hasn't had the best of days here. In the past 24 to 36 hours, they've brought him nothing but grief. First, He had to trumpet the praises of Mordecai throughout the city of Shushan. And now the queen herself was accusing him to the king. And he's downright terrified, and rightly so. 
But we, on the other hand, are cheering, right? Because we want justice. We want good rewarded. We want evil punished. Haman ought not to have been running around calling the shots anyway. They ought to finish him off, which is exactly what the king does. We see the delay that sealed the sentence. Verse 7. And the king, aspiring from the banquet of wine in his wrath, or arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath, went into the palace garden, and Haman stood up to make a request for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Well, the king was mad. He rose up from the table and walked out into the garden. And there are times when it's better not to say what's on your mind until you've gotten your thoughts together. And while he was in the garden, Haman realized that he had one last chance to save himself. Now the custom of the day when banqueting was in that day was of banqueting in that day was to recline rather than sit on the back of a high chair like we do in modern times. So they would recline on couches and they would stay long after a meal just to you know, sit around and do nothing. So when the king went outside, his queen was reclining on a couch. And as soon as the king was out of sight, Haman realized that if he had any chance at all to be saved, he needed to petition the queen. But little did he know that that would be his undoing. Haman went over to the queen and begged her in verse 8. Then the king returned out of the palace unto the garden, into the palace of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. Now this doesn't mean that he tried to seduce her. What it means is that he went to the foot of the couch where she was reclining and began in, or, in an oriental custom to embrace her feet and to beg to save his life, to stand in this place to save his life. And his intensity, in, his, in his intensity to get this woman to save his life, he placed himself in a position for the king to say, in the rest of verse 8, Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, it covered Haman's face. As soon as the king said this, the servants covered Haman, his face. This was a sign that he was doomed to die even though the king had not pronounced death upon him. And when they put the bag on his head, that meant that there was no chance for Haman to be saved. His sentence was sealed. Which leads us to the decree that settled the issue. Verse 9 and 10. In Harbona, one of the chamberlains said before the king, Behold, also the gallows, 50 cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. Let the king, uh, then the king said, hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. Now Harbona was the chamberlain of the king and was one of those sent to get Vashti to bring her to the king's party in chapter 1. And he was also one of the chamberlains that went to get Haman to bring him to the banquet. And maybe as he's fetching Haman, he saw the gallows that had been built on Haman's property. And at this moment, when the opportunity arose, he told the king that Haman uh, could be punished on the very gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. All the time that Haman was having the gallows built, he could see, enthusiast enthusiastically anticipate Mordecai impaled there. But now he's condemned to die on those same gallows himself. On the gallows prepared by Haman, Haman was hanged because God faithfully saw that justice would be done. Psalm 7.15 says this, He made a pit and digged it and has fallen into the ditch which he made. That's what happened to Haman. He made a pit, so to speak, and he's the one that ended up falling in. Now, some have said that Esther was not very merciful at this moment. Some have written that she was not righteous because she could have had Haman's life spared, but she didn't. Well, maybe in her heart she wanted to be merciful, but logic restrained her, and she let the man die. 
Remember, there's a law, a divine truth that we need to remember, and it's found in Galatians 6, 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And many times what we set out to do to others in the providence of God is reaped back upon us. A story in the Bible illustrates this perfectly. Daniel spent all night in the lion's den, and the lions didn't touch him. But the people who were responsible for putting Daniel in there were thrown in after Daniel was taken out, and they were torn apart before their bodies even hit the floor. What they attempted to do to God's people was turn back on their own heads. And so it was with Haman. Now, let, as we close, let me give you three quick things that we learn from this story. First is the delay of justice is not the denial of justice. The delay of justice is not the denial of justice. Now, why does God wait so long to execute his justice? Why did he take so long to take care of Haman? I mean, couldn't he have stopped him in the beginning? Well, of course. But maybe he waited, as he often does with us, to give him an opportunity to repent. And though we cannot always see it, God's working behind the scenes. His justice is not lost. God is watching over his own. And then secondly, the deliverance of one may be the doom of another. The deliverance of one may be the doom of another. Now Haman, who is the favorite prime minister of Ahasuerus, wealthy, strong, noble, is hanged on the gallows. Mordecai, the despised Jew, whose life is in serious jeopardy, is promoted to the highest favor and the most influence with the king. The deliverance of one is often the doom of another. And then thirdly, the dedication of one can make the difference for many. The dedication of one can make the difference for many. You know, it's really hard to believe that one person can make a difference in the course of human history. But listen, if you subtract Esther from the Old Testament, then there's no Jewish nation. There's no Jesus Christ. There's no Bible. There's no hope for mankind. Because Esther was the link that preserved the Jewish nation. She was the one who God used to turn the events of the world around. And he might choose you or I in a significant way as well. The dedication of one can often make the difference for many. So since we're trapped in this earthbound cage, this little space where light is often scattered and, and God sometimes seems silent or he is silent, how can we be sensitive to his interventions? We do what we do, or what we do, what do we do when we, like Job, struggle in the fog of God's silence, when we're convinced that his silence means his absence? What do we do? We follow what we've learned here tonight. And please be, be, be assured, he's not absent. He may be silent, but he's not absent. And at the moment, the precise moment, when it will have its greatest impact, God ceases his silence and sovereignly makes his move. So, Father in heaven, we thank you, dear Lord, for the things we've learned tonight from the life of Esther.